everyone. I'm Michelle. Uh, Dave and I have been in the beauty and e-com space for about 15 plus years. It's good to see one of us is using the products and getting results. <laughs> Just kidding, he's 65 and looks great. <laughs> um, so being in the same industry, we often end up at the same conferences. Usually I'm somewhere out in the crowd. Within eyesight, I can remind him of his posture and just smile. So being on stage today is a little bit different. I was trying to think of what beverage and beauty have in common, but I guess the more of the delicious alcoholic beverages you guys are making, the more beautiful everybody becomes <laughs> if we're imbibing. Um, David's going to speak today about omnichannel failures and successes. So we're going to sit down, I guess, for 20 minutes. Um, I'm sure that sounds fun to you guys, right? Sitting with your wife for 20 <laughs> minutes, questions and answers. Um, I'm slightly familiar with your backgrounds and uh, that brief stint as a male hand model, but why don't you share with the um, audience how you got into cosmetics? Sure. Thanks. <laughs> um, first of all, thanks Bill and Layla for having us. Um, uh, we had a pre-call with Richard, who was going to be the moderator, and Richard, if you know him, is a pretty tough guy, and he sounded like he was going to skewer me, so when he couldn't make it, I was a little relieved, and then they said, well, now we're going to have Michelle sit up here with you, and I really went into full panic mode. I, I don't think I've been this nervous since I proposed. Um, so how did I get into beauty? I mean, come on. Um, I... It, it was. I graduated from law school and business school in 1999. Uh, obviously, the e-com boom was the first boom. Uh, it was happening then. Uh, I did not want to be a lawyer, so I was very, very, very excited to start a web business and start selling something online. I didn't know what, uh, but I just knew I had to sell something on the internet because every person in the world is buying online, of course, in 1999. Um, my mother is a dermatologist. Um, Mark will be happy to know that my mother uh, actually removes tattoos from gangsters. So Mark, uh, kudos to you and the homeboy guys. Um, uh, she sold products in her office. And I said, hey, mom, can I build you a website? And she said, what's the internet? And I said, Don't worry <laughs> about it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get this set up, and we'll just start selling your products online. One thing led to another. We continued to sell. We were successful. We uh, rolled that out to multiple physicians, uh, managed their web fulfillment. Uh, and, their, and their products, and um, that business then, I rolled into Derm Store, they acquired us. Uh, Derm Store was then acquired by Target. Uh, I was actually doing a business development deal with Net-A-Porter, they'd asked if I'd launch Beauty for them. I couldn't turn that out, down, we'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, sorry, I'm answering yeah, questions. Yeah, you're uh, going ahead. <laughs> uh, and now I'm currently the, Cos uh, the CEO of Cosbar, which is a chain of luxury beauty stores, uh, there's 20 stores across the country. We sell luxury beauty products, uh, and we also have a website. And so when did you see a mainstream shift from consumers purchasing in-store to online, and how did traditional cosmetic retailers like department stores uh, react to that change? Frankly, it's, it's been really slow. I was talking to somebody outside, and he was telling me that in food and beverage, the e-com channel only represents like 3% of your total market, which is shockingly low. I will tell another horrible story that in 1999, I had a friend that worked at Webvan. No giggles, then clearly you don't remember how miserable that was. Uh, but I pushed my entire life savings into Webvan because I thought, who the hell ever wants to go into a grocery store uh, ever again? And, and Webvan was the solution to that, selling groceries online. Instacart. Um, yeah, now it's Instacart. <laughs> but the fact that it's still very, very small is, is really interesting to me. Beauty uh, is about depends on who you're talking to with all, all these DTC companies, but it's probably about 15% of the total channel is sold online. Um, for us, uh, for me, I just, I honestly can't believe that it's not 100%. Beauty is very unique because you want to touch the product, you want to see the product, you want to feel the product. I will tell you, it happened very quickly, um, for, for me at least. I just couldn't imagine people not buying things online. The department store is very slow to the game. I think they're paying for it now. Um, there's been a lot of disruption in the beauty space with these DTC companies selling online. Um, and I will tell you that it's going to happen very, very fast. Uh, Ecom is just so simple, so quick. Um, just be prepared because it kind of has this slow roll and the next thing you know, it's like boom, 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 boom. And everyone's buying everything online. And of course, with Amazon, that's, uh, they make it a lot easier. 
I would think, similar to Beauty and Beverage, the PepsiCo and the L'Oreal and Lauders snapping up all the small indie. Yeah, things. for yeah. sure. Um, I mean, there's lots of acquisitions going on in the beauty space right now. I'm sure a lot of you've heard about it. Um, but a lot of it is the interest in DTC. Um, mm -hmm. It's just very, very hot in the beauty space right now. Uh, Zach mentioned having that relationship directly with the consumer is, is huge, uh, especially in beauty. So it's uh, very interesting. Christopher knows that too. And so when you were deciding on joining net a -Porte, what were some of the pros besides giving me the discounts <laughs> um, and cons Ugh. building out the beauty division of such a well-known e-retailer? I mean, the con was the discount <laughs> because the amount you spent uh, <laughs> at net a -Porte, I think we're still paying for it, although the sample sale was a great benefit. Um, so with net a -Porte, uh, those of you who don't know it, it, it was a luxury fashion retailer founded again in 1999. Um, when Natalie Massonet, the founder, was being told no one will ever buy luxury clothing online. Clearly, that's gone uh, by the wayside. net porte is now a multi-billion dollar company, merged with Ukes um, and is gigantic. But the thing I understood in beauty was the power of storytelling. Um, when we worked at Derm Store and for these physicians, there was no stories being told online. It was really just putting the product up on the site and hopefully picking up some de uh, demand and selling it. Replenishment. Replenishment. Mm -hmm. um, even today, beauty is still online, highly replenishable products. And I think a lot of you out here have highly replenishable products. <laughs> so that grows really, really quickly. Um, but with net porte they are the experts in storytelling. I mean, content was the focus of their business. PR and content. Natalie always used to say that's how the business was built, just PR and content. They had no money. Um, they did the same-day delivery vans, which at the time was earth shattering. They did same day delivery in Manhattan with all their vans. It was, uh, it was an incredible company. And the storytelling piece in beauty was really, really critical. Online, you can't touch the product. You can't taste the product. You can't smell the product. How do you sell it best? Telling stories. And net a -Porte, uh, was the best at it. And I thought at the time, uh, it could be a huge success. And it's the beauty business on net a -Porte has grown to be really large. And the con from joining such a well-established e-retailer? Um, I didn't know this question was coming, but from my perspective, they just kind of parachuted me in and said, figure it out. So like Joe was saying, I was just like pounding away at people within the organization, uh, just like getting everybody on board with this beauty thing because everybody thought, why would we sell beauty on our, our beautiful fashion site? And I just had to convince them all that it was the wave of the future. And when did Which ironically, they <laughs> were already the wave of the future by selling fashion, but yeah. beauty was still uh, in its infancy online. And then when did Cosbar start selling to their clientele online? Was that before or after you joined as the CEO? So I remember giving a talk at net a uh, and I literally said, brick and mortar is dead. <laughs> um, and since then, I've joined a brick and mortar retailer. Um, and at the time, I thought, well, yeah, I'm at net a um, if, if we can't tell the story and, and we're not getting 100% of the market share, we're doing something wrong. What's the missing piece? And the missing piece really is people and locations and experiences, these live things that happen in store that you today at least cannot create online. I mean, Zach is mentioning this drugstore. That's an incredible experience. Um, and having people you, in beauty, you just cannot recreate that online. So when you're in a retail environment, making sure those people are very well trained, you know, making sure that they connect with the consumer, it's critical still to have people. Even if beauty e-com grows to be 50%, of the total piece of the pie, uh, it's, still, it's still small, and you still need that physical sense. Zach also mentioned that you know, a lot of these digital-only players are moving to physical, and there's a reason for that. It's, it's the experience that you cannot create online. And I thought at net a -Porte we could do that, and we made a lot of great strides to bring beauty to life uh, online, but you can't beat people and physical uh, experiences. And the consumer's looking for that experiential element, too, with the pop-ups and everything that you're trying and doing, both at net a -Porte and Cosbar. For sure. I mean, the physical experience is, is key. I think in modern retail, um, everyone has to kind of figure out how to play nicely with, ev with everybody. A lot of people today have talked about competition. I'm also very open to sharing our successes, partially because I think, go ahead and try, um, but mostly because I think Retailers are going to have to get smarter. They're going to have to work together. Uh, players that you might not necessarily think 
can play in the sandbox together, can and will, and do it in a unique and cool way. Um, I, I just think the physical piece of brick and mortar is, is far from dead, and I wish that wasn't recorded. <laughs> and so um, how did you first implement the e-commerce strategy at Cosbar since digital was so small for them? Yeah, digital was an afterthought at Cosbar. Um, it was... The reason they built a website is actually they did a partnership with Target. Uh, so they had to scramble and get a website built, but there had been no thought put into it. It was just uh, a transactional place. Um, the first day in my vision of Cosbar the entire time has been omnichannel. Omnichannel, omnichannel, omnichannel. You have to touch the consumer in every place that they are. It's critical. Um, you've got these great physical locations. How do you enhance those physical locations with digital? Um, and it's been uh, a journey so far. So will you share a big success Sh or sure. a big failure? I mean, I think when you think about retail, there are very, very good brick and mortar people, and there are very, very good digital people, and there are essentially no people that know how to combine both. I mean, it's such a new experience. It's, you know, at best, Omnichannel is five years old. I think a lot of people are making a lot of mistakes on the way. Um, I have this ridiculous acronym, ABTO, always be thinking Omni. I literally repeat it every day. I think there's day. an F in there somewhere. Well, no, yeah. so yes. <laughs> When, when people say, like, let's do this for, for our dot com, and, and I say, well, ABTO, like, what are we going to do in the physical space to make sure that translates? You want to give the customer the same experience both digitally and physically, and, and it's your opportunity to really grab hold tightly of them. I mean, the physical piece you grab hold tightly, and then how do you translate that digitally? It's really, really hard to do, and not many people are doing it out there very well, and we try to do it, whether it's same-day delivery, buy online, pick up in store. All these things sound like they're happening all over the place and they're just not still. I mean, there is such a long runway to connect the two dots and to make everything omni-channel. Um, it's, it's exciting to me, also very challenging. I mean, we've had so many hiccups along the way. I mean, Caitlin said, I mean, things break every five seconds. It's literally like we're trying to connect digital dots, we're trying to connect systems together and it just constantly falling apart. <laughs> and we're just trying to put it back together and make it, make it whole. And, and to us, ultimately, it's the experience that the customer has. So when something does break, we scramble very quickly to get it fixed and give them the best possible experience. And if you were to give three pointers to beverage brands implementing an omnichannel strategy or adding an e-commerce strategy to their current retail play, what would they do? Three? Be? Richard was only going to ask me for one. Um, uh, I'll start with one, and if I can think of two more, <laughs> we'll go from there. Um, in omnichannel and in retail and in branding, I think the number one most critical thing is the consumer. Um, they are driving the conversations now. I'm not very familiar with the beverage industry, but you know, seeing Coke signs everywhere, and it's delicious, and people holding hands across the United States, you know that that was cool back then, but now. It's the consumer driving the messaging. They are your branding tool. They, you have to focus on them to deliver uh, what they want. Um, if they want a product in the middle of the night and they want a text, you have to give it to them. I mean, it's so critical in everything that you do. It's, um, they have to be the center of, all, of honestly, all your decision making. Uh, they are the power of your brand now through Instagram, through social media, they can crush your brand overnight. I mean, if something goes viral that's bad, it's awful. But at the same time, you know, they're thinking of your brand in ways that you haven't necessarily thought about, and that's what you have to regroup on too as well, I believe. You have to look at the conversations out there that are happening about your brand, and if they're good, definitely embrace them. Do what you can to make them part of your branding um, because that's what the consumer thinks about. If you're thinking about things... Um, and you hear things that aren't aligned from the consumer, you are not on the right track. Uh, you really have to listen to them. You have to listen to your social media channels. You have to reach out to customers. Um, you know, every Instagram uh, post you have to comment on, you have to say thank you. I mean, the expectations of consumers are through the roof and they're only getting, I guess, better or worse, but they're only getting more yeah. challenging. Um, and you have to service the consumer or, or you're gonna die. I love the phrase, by the way, an inch 
uh, wide and a mile deep. I mean, I think knowing your consumer and going with that group, you're going to find people that can engage that engage with you, that understand what you're doing, and, and you can go deep on those people and, and be a really strong brand. Thanks. I'm going to steal that one. And then I'm also um, going to steal Joe's picking up a wheelbarrow. Just like at home, Sorry. every time I try to I'm talk. I'm also going to p- pick up a wheelbarrow and running really hard. I'm just going to... That's how we run business too. Small entrepreneurs, you have to you have to do that. So to go on a little bit of a side note, you have to just go to the wall on everything. I mean, it's just constantly doing it. My team is constantly telling me, God, you're just pushing us too hard. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna push you harder because we just gotta keep moving, we gotta plow through this, and we gotta be the best that we can be. Sorry. <laughs> Speaking about talking about listening to your consumers, <laughs> do you want to talk anything about your loyalty program you developed and sure at Cost Bar? I, yeah that I mean the DTC piece you have the great opportunity to create a loyalty program if you're not going to do it beauty loyalty is everything I mean you look at Sephora you look at Ulta eighty five percent of their revenue is coming from their loyalty programs um, we just launched one two years ago and it's now like seventy five percent of our revenue I mean. It, it gets the consumer coming back. It doesn't make you look like you're discounting your brand um, because we're a luxury retailer. We never say 20% off. Um, we always say triple points or something of that nature uh, to kind of get around the, the luxury stigma. So I would really recommend a loyalty program. It just builds the strength that you have with your consumer. And again, by putting the consumer at the center, they all love loyalty programs. We decide to keep it as simple as humanly possible. Um, there's a lot of weird, complex things out there. There's also great, I will say, I've seen some great experiential loyalty benefits where like, uh, you know, maybe a Sufferfest takes you on a bike ride or something of that nature to their VIPs or something and gets a, you know, you get a free keg or something. I don't know what it is. But I think putting that on top of something really basic and simple where your consumers feel like you're giving something back to them uh, is, is very powerful and works quickly. I mean, literally, we fired this thing up and in two years it was a huge chunk of our business. So I think we're through the questions. We can take questions from the audience if there are any. I'm always thinking about how do we strengthen the physical relationship with digital. Um, we actually partnered with this company called Stella Connect, which is fantastic for us. It, um, it, it's basically you go in, you transact, and then when you walk out, you actually get an email from the person that you worked with. And it's a, a picture of their face, and it says, hi, I'm Jane. It's kind of like Uber, hi, I'm Jane. But we, get a, we make it a little bit more personal, like here are the products that you bought. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. And then we take it even further. We're like, I have a dog and two kids. And you know, if you ever have any questions, contact me anytime. Then we have them uh, rank the experience. We get a lot of five stars. When we don't get five stars, it's actually great too because it's an opportunity for us to repair that relationship. And then we give the consumer the opportunity to give that beauty specialist a lunch, a coffee, or a massage. Um, so it's acknowledging our staff with these kind of great benefits. And if they get you know, 20 coffees, they, they get a coffee. If they get 30 massages, they get a massage. So for us, it's been great. And, and uh, Stella's been fantastic. And, and it's just another way to connect the consumer to, to our specialists. For sure, retailers are demanding. Christopher can, I'm sure, tell you that. Um, we want a lot because we invest a lot into getting your brand out there and, and making your brand, you know, living with other brands and giving you the opportunity to have the customer shop. So we, we, it is demanding and it is very challenging. But if you ask some brands, they have fabulous relationships with retailers. We have great relationships with all ours and we're kind of successful. For, for newer brands, it is very, very hard. We do demand a lot. I'm not going to sugarcoat that, but we do, if we see a brand that we love that has a great story, we'll do what we can to bring them along. Um, you know, we're highlighting now newer, smaller brands in our store. So that's an opportunity too. If you take Sephora, it's a great example. They're doing that as well and finding great success. I mean, you know, a brand can stand on its own two feet. If they can do it in a retailer, they can do it anywhere. Obviously, there's these brands that are DTC. Um, some are very powerful, but we think as retailers, you know, we give them kind of the magic sauce that they need. And I do think that there's a lot going on right now in the space. Uh, the DTC thing in particular is, is interesting. I do think that, you know, a lot of these DTC brands will end up going with retailers as well and kind of figuring out the, the in-between space because it's, there's room for all of us. I always say that women do not shop single brand. They shop multi-brand. So that's what a retailer brings as well. 
Um, I will say Zach's very interesting with his multi-brand strategy in a DTC umbrella, and I think that's what a lot of brands are kind of thinking about doing now. Um, but retail is also expensive. Uh, brick and mortar is expensive. People are expensive, but they create the experience for you. Yeah, I would actually say that's where beauty is behind food and beverage. I mean, the clean movement, I feel like, has been happening in food a lot longer. Beauty, it's really having a moment right now, and I think it's going to continue to. Um, I think the packaging is becoming less important. I think the whole notion of luxury is changing a bit, especially in beauty. Um, so we're kind of looking at it as luxury to us is the service that you get in our store, and the products don't necessarily have to be, you know, the solid gold... Uh, packaging with you know one tenth of one ounce of product within um, I think it's important to the consumer so I do think that's shifting I think people are coming more cognizant of ingredients um, uh, I think there's there is a big shift there in the beauty industry for I sure. think Millennials all are helping to drive that they're wanting to know what's in the product and are, are starting the conversation and I think that the brands have to react and a lot of them that are doing it well are listening and that they're willing to invest for I mean, influencers are huge in our industry right now. Um, with that comes kind of exorbitant rates, uh, what people are asking for. Speed of market. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is the Kardashian effect. I mean, look at their own brand. Uh, the one daughter, which one? Kylie. Kylie has a $400 million <laughs> beauty business. Uh, basically overnight. So, I, I mean, that says it all, really. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>